this, how can you how can you get better habits to prevent it in the future? So all of this has been made possible since TexasInvasives.org was first founded 15 years ago. And then TISI has been made because of our state and federal partners listed below, like USDA AFIS, AgriLife Extension, Sam Houston State University, and the US Forest Service. So when I mean a one-stop shop, uh, invasive species information is our websites that are available to the public at all times. So you have texasinvasives.org, which is the Texas Invasives homepage that you might be familiar with, but we also have our own website, tsusinvasives.org. Ideally, we're going to merge them at some point in time, but right now, Either way you get, if you do Texas and Invasives, you will find our websites that have illustrated descriptions, pictures. They talk about distribution habitat, management strategies, native lookalikes. So some of the species that I'll talk to you about today and their management strategies, I don't expect you to remember them. You can always go back to our websites for more information. And this QR code right here is just quick link tree links to our reporting page. So to start at the beginning, right, if we if we all have the same understanding of what an invasive species is, then we know how to identify them in the future. So in 1999, President Bill Clinton issued an executive um, order to address invasive species management. So think about the timeline when I started talking about when invasives have been here and when we actually started doing something about it. So it's only been 24 years when this definition was created. And so an invasive species is a species not native to an ecosystem under consideration whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. That part is red and bolded because that is the important part of an invasive species. That is what separates it from a weed or an exotic or an ornamental. Is it causing harm once it's released? And that harm can come in many different facets. It can impact our recreation, our health, our livestock's health. It can impact our prairie health. So the natural heritage, our forestry, agriculture, economy. Economy was the big flashing one that got the federal government intention because invasive species are known to cause not just the United States. We have sent out plenty of invasives to other countries. It can cost the world billions and trillions of dollars in management, but the United States alone does spend billions of dollars to manage invasive species. So the way that harm can be presented, sometimes one species only causes harm in one aspect, sometimes it can cause harm in many different ways. And the infamous example that I like to use for this is the red imported fire ant. So yes, please make note, fire ants are not native. I am born and raised in Texas, grew up with fire ants, thought they were just here. They were Texas ants. They are not. They're native to South America and they were brought here through potted plants. So they pose serious ecological harm because they attack native ground dwelling animals like our bob white quail, our horned lizards, things that need net safe ground nests to survive. They also destroy any other arthropod community, displace native ants, they take over whatever they want. And then they have serious economic impacts as well. They do not stop with um, arthropods, they will destroy your crops as well. They can harm your livestock. And fire ants alone cost Texas $500 million a year just to manage. This is not eradication. They are found in 95% of our Texas counties. So this is just to control them in a sense. And they also cause harm to human and animal health. If you are allergic to fire ant bites, just like if you are allergic to honeybee stings, this can cause anaphylactic shock. So this one invasive species causes harm in multiple, multiple ways. So if they just stayed in place, that would be great. If they only caused harm, we could go right where they are. We could trap them, right? We could stop it as soon as it happens. The problem is invasive species are also very good at spreading. So they cause harm. That's what causes the definition. But that's where they get the word invasive as well. They invade and take over a territory. Maybe they make more eggs. Maybe they produce more seeds. Maybe they're drought tolerant like right now, right? They are able to be more hardy. 
So my infamous example for the spread is the red imported lionfish. So this is a lionfish that is still sold in pet stores today. It is not a prohibited species. So the story of the lionfish, it was in an aquarium in Miami, Florida. Nothing unusual about that. You can go to any aquarium and see these. They are stunning fishes. The problem is that they have parapolitic venom in their spines. It will kill humans. It will kill sharks. It can kill... It, we have predators in our bays that are not adapted for this. So there's an aquarium in Miami and a hurricane happens in 1985. Nothing unusual there. They get hurricanes all the time. A pair of lionfish escaped. This is 1985. It was kind of one of those, what can we do? They're already in the ocean, right? What, what's the difference between the Atlantic Ocean and the South Pacific? Who, who's to care? What, what can we do? So nothing was done. So the first 12 years, nothing really much to look at. The problem is that they have no predators. They have a venom that makes them immune to attack. They can eat anything smaller than themselves. So they basically made the Atlantic and the Gulf their new home. And they are now found all the way from Philadelphia down to Venezuela. And they are polluting <laughs> the coral reefs throughout the area as well. And the way that they're doing that is because they are eating any fish that maintain our coral reefs. So subsequently they are causing coral reef death. And considering that in the Gulf of Mexico off of Belize is the second largest coral reef in the entire world, this is a very big problem. It's one of those, what if we had just done something about it to begin with? And that's really why we talk about not dumping your aquariums. It may seem harmless. You may think you're releasing it to the wild. The problem is it could be invasive. So how do they spread? A lot of it is accidental. We have been importing and exporting goods for a millennia, humans have been moving things around because they smell good, they look fun, they taste weird, whatever it is, we've been moving things around accidentally. So produce, ship ballast water, packing materials and containers. So emerald ash borers were on ash pallets just like this. They were pupated in the wood. Zebra mussels came in ballast water that was released from Eurasia when it docked here in the United States, right? There's a lot of accidental, but we've had a lot of purposeful spread as well. And the main contributors to the purposeful spread has been the ornamental planting so the nursery industry and then your pets and aquarium industry. So like I touched on the red line fish, that's not prohibited. You can go buy one today if you want. I, you know, but it's one of those, should you, do you have the responsibility to keep care of it forever? And also think about pythons in Florida, right? That all came from aquarium and pet releases. And then also we're trying to undo some damage. So right here, you see a gentleman here with a large toad that is called a king toad. And this is in Australia. So Australia was having a problem with some insects and they thought you know what let's bring over this cane toad that's known to call like that's known to keep it in check why don't we bring those over the problem with the cane toad is as you can see it's gets huge but it has a hallucinogenic chemical on its skin and considering that australia has hundreds of species that are unique to its island specifically marsupials this has caused significant damage to their native animal populations because the cane toad did not control the issue they populated with no problems and now they're harming the native fauna this, the United States has done the same thing with grass carp trying to control hydrilla. So sometimes the purposeful thing has been releasing biocontrols too early. So that's why we try to take a lot more care, us researchers, when we release biocontrols. As I've kind of hinted before, it's really important to note that invasive does not always mean illegal. Even with the executive order, there are hundreds of invasive plants that are still sold in animals, and you're going to find major contradictions. There are some lists that the Parks and Wildlife and our Department of Agriculture have created that I'll discuss later on how you can report entities that are selling plants that they shouldn't be. So what can you do? The real thing is be aware of dispersal. Do not give them a free ride, right? Be aware of the, pu the public awareness campaigns. They exist for a reason. 
we're talking about clean draining and drying your boat. That's now a state law. It's because unclean boats, recreational boats have been directly linked to the spread of hydrilla, giant salvinia, zebra mussels, quagga mussels, Asian clams, right? It it has caused significant impact. So something as simple as clean draining and drying your boat has a major impact, not moving firewood and never dumping your aquarium. You can also always sign up for our monthly eyewire. We do provide a monthly eyewire that's sent out and it covers different invasive species topics that are happening. Sometimes there is good news. Eradication is possible and research is ongoing to find new ways to treat our invasive species that don't always involve chemicals. So to help prevent transport, you clean, drain, dry your boat. Remember, it is a law now, please. And then you don't move firewood. I, I know that this sounds silly. It sounds silly to so many people. They're like, what are you talking about? Why can't I take firewood from the dead tree on my neighbor's property to my house? The thing is, how did your dead tree, how did the tree die? Did it die from beetles killing it native or invasive bark beetles are a major issue i've had many people attending my workshops that were like oh is that how my oak tree died because my neighbor's oak died we felled it i brought it back for firewood and now my tree is dying because of beetles i was like yes that's exactly why we don't want you to move firewood so always make sure that you're getting it from a reliable source you burn it where you buy it if you go to a state park, you leave that extra wood for the state park. They could always use a little extra funding. So don't move firewood. Be sure to leave no trace. Keep Texas beautiful. Check your new plants when you bring them into your area. We have a lot of soil dwelling organisms that are still being moved around because of the plant industry. So we help researchers, I'm out there, I'm trapping, I'm monitoring, and I'm doing my best to detect as, as well as I can, but I am only one set of eyes. And that's why we created our Sentinel Pest Network. It is a network of plants where, and pests that we need your help with detection. So this is something I'll touch on when in between talking about invasive species management, but our Sentinel Pest Network has grown from 12 species to over 24 species at this point. And these are ones that, yes, you could see in this right column, most of them are found in Texas. You might think, okay, they're already here. What's the problem? We need to know exactly where. We need to be tracking them as quickly as possible because there is possibility of eradication. And also many of these species we want to prevent from ever getting here. So if we're educating and we're empowering the public to report on these species, we can prevent them from being established. So what I mean by anybody can report on these species, you can go right to our webpage, texasinvasives.org. This is how it looks. This is our sentinel pest list. It doesn't require a login. If you've heard that from our citizen scientist trainings, you don't need a login for your sentinel pest network. You can always go to the take action tab and report it if you prefer a scrolling list. And this QR code, that's one of the hot links on there just to kind of let you see what it looks like on your phone and how you can report in the future. So I did talk about, we have texasinvasives.org and tsusinvasives.org. Those are websites you can always go to for information on species that we'll talk about or to even check, you know, on texasinvasives.org, we do have buttons that will highlight, is this a state noxious weed? Okay, maybe I should be reporting this because I just saw the nursery down the road selling them. And then we also always love to highlight HARC, their quiet invasion booklet. Uh, this is for the lower Galveston Bay watershed and upper Texas coast, but a lot of the species apply to the entire state. They have a wonderful digital version any, you know, all of these resources are wonderful to use and you can always go to invasive.org. So those lists that I was talking about, there is, there is a noxious and invasive plant list. There are some species that are prohibited for sale in the state of Texas. If you enter TDA, T Texas Department of Ag, noxious, it will bring you to this page and you can go right down here to the link to see the list itself. Please, if you, um, Please check this before you're buying any plants and 
I mean, they shouldn't be sold. And if you do see a nursery selling, please contact me. This is my personal email. I do have connections with TDA. I act as an in, I can help alert them in a quicker sense. And they can at least go out to the nursery and give them a warning or issue a fine, depending on how many times. And we have to hold people accountable on the on what they're doing. So this is it. This is the list of noxious and invasive plants that are prohibited in the state of Texas. So some are very familiar, China berry, Chinese tallow, climbing fern, kudzu, giant reed, salt cedar, tropical soda apple, all of those should not be sold anywhere. But if you look at our database compared to the list, right, we have hundreds of invasive plants and here we have about 30 species listed. Nevertheless, it's really important to make sure these aren't being sold. There are prohibited, there are many more prohibited fish, shellfish, and aquatic plants out there. That And that list is generated by Parks and Wildlife. And if you see any aquarium stores selling these prohibited items like water hyacinth, apple snails, or snakehead fish, we do need you to email Parks and Wildlife at aquatic.invasives at tpwd.texas.gov, right? There's so many other things they could be selling we don't need them to be selling illegal things. So invasive species, I mean, there's a lot of control, management, monitoring, treatment that we are trying to facilitate on our end, but the research and the state and the federal entities is only one part of the picture. The other part is informed and engaged citizens like you being empowered to remove invasives in your own property, your own prairie, right? Just being aware and empowered is really a, the main part. So where will you find invasive species? You're going to find them everywhere. And I do want to note that I'm going to talk about a few species, but I understand this may not be the species that you're mainly dealing with. I only have so much time to talk, <laughs> so I didn't want to delve in too deep, but please remember you can always go to our websites about these. So invasives that you will easily and probably already have encountered in your prairie are things like Chinese tallow, deep-rooted sedge, china berry, Johnson grass, feral hogs, bahia grass, McCartney rose, giant reed, right? There's a lot of troublesome grasses and plants that you can find in your area and feral hogs will be an issue no matter where you are. And the reason for that is feral hogs were brought by conquistadors as a food source. So they were brought back as far as the 1600s. And Texas, being one of the first states that the conquistadors settled in, were practically ground zero for feral hogs. That's also why Parks and Wildlife does not care when you manage your feral hogs, right? It is an invasive species that needs to be removed. We'll talk about how to manage more of the plants later, right? Everyone can imagine how to manage a feral hog on their property. So since we're in the Gulf Coastal area, you have easily wooded areas as well that could be near. And also you'll notice there's gonna be an overlap in general on some of these pests and plants that you'll find. So you still have the tallow, the china berry, the hogs, but now you might be encountering more of your privets, which are still for sale. They're not prohibited. Your Japanese climbing fern, spotted lantern fly. This is a species that is not here in Texas and we do not want it here. So it's really important to just keep an eye out for things like this. And then the emerald ash borer, which just recently expanded from the, to Cook County. So it's now found in five North Texas counties. It was first found in the Texarkana area, then Fort Worth, Dallas, and now Cook County, which is adjacent to the DFW area. So that is one that is spreading throughout your ash trees invasives in your waterways. So you'll see tallow and reed are kind of just listed all the time because they are very hardy. They are very resilient and they will make home in your wetlands, in your dry prairies, in your alleyways, they will make a home. So invasives in your waterways, salvinia, tallow, giant reed, hydrilla, Suckermouth catfish have become a really big issue in the Houston and San Antonio waterways, especially the bio, bayou systems in Houston. This is directly related to aquarium fish. Yes, that is the sucker. That is the algae eater that you see in your aquaria. 
Also apple snails and eggs, which are species that we want you to track and report to us. And then golden bamboo, which can be also very temperamental. Asian tiger mosquito, you know, it's one of those watch your standing water, those kinds of treatments. If you're treating for mosquitoes in general, you'll be managing Asian tiger mosquitoes. It's just always a fun reminder that, yeah, we have invasive mosquitoes as well, which we didn't need. And then invasives in your backyard and garden. These will be ones that you will most likely encounter in your own area. These will be ones that you probably already know about. So hammerhead flatworms been getting a lot of press again this year. It's because it is weird looking and it is a predator of earthworms. You have invasive slugs. The one pictured here is the black velvet leatherleaf slug. I like to highlight this one because it, it's very unique. It's matte. It's black. We do not have any slug that looks like it. Your EAB, it will be at any ash tree that's around. So any species of ash is susceptible in your own backyard or on your prairie, or even, you know, your farmland or your property in another part of the state. Your Asian jumping worms, we have found out that these are prevalent throughout the state. We just started asking for citizen reports at the end of last year, and now we can confirm that it is from in the Dallas, San Antonio, Conroe, and Beaumont areas, and Buda. So it's kind of that whole metroplex area and it's one of those if it's found there it's probably statewide and it's one of those we haven't been catching it so an asian jumping worm it's really important to look at the differences between the two and really look for that white collar please go to our website for that one if you notice if you're having issue with your plants seeding or the soil is just not retaining moisture or nutrients, you might have to dig a little deeper. It could be Asian jumping worms. They completely deplete the soil of any nutrients, so it's important to get them removed as quickly as possible. Your red bay ambrosia beetle, this attacks avocados and red bay trees, and it is spreading throughout the Gulf Coastal area. The beetle has been confirmed throughout East Texas and um, even over to Harris County. And the Asian citrus psyllid, I'm going to touch more on this one in a little bit. This is becoming really prevalent. Our counties in the Houston and the Corpus area are under quarantine for the movement of citrus products because of this pest. So these are ones that you can easily find in your backyard. And then it's always important to remember, invasive does not mean prohibited to sell. So you probably have, you know, Nandina, privets, bamboo, elephant ears, honeysuckles, tree of heaven, and mimosa in your own area. And you can easily encounter these for sale. And um, I mean, it can be almost impossible to find management strategies for some of these because they're still so prevalent in the ornamental industry, but you can always go to our website. So the, the main take home message for if you are trying to remove and manage invasive species, it is not easy, please stay vigilant. If, if invasive species were easy, I, I wouldn't have this job. I, I would be doing something else related to wildlife biology because we wouldn't even have this topic. So usually it requires a mixed uh, combined integrated pest management strategy. So oftentimes you might need to be combining your mechanical, your chemical and your biological together. And especially with um, your invasive plant removal. And, and as y'all know, especially doing restoration, monitoring that seed bank and preventing re-sprouting re -spout, re is very important. So timing your seeding and your tillage is going to be important to stop that regrowth, right? We have to cut it back and then replant in hopes to smother it out in a way. Mechanical is very effective at the beginning. So if the tree, you know, if it's small, hand pulling is great. Weed wrenching is very effective. And consistent mowing it depends on what you're trying to manage. So definitely look into that because some plants love getting mowed. You just make it happier when you mow it. And then 
you know, we're not even going to touch too much on prescribed fire right now, considering most of the states in a burn ban. But prescribed fire is very effective against most invasive plants. So thinking about that, maybe the rainy season next year, trying to coordinate with an entity that can help you with that. If you are doing more of the mechanical aspect, you can also look into tree girdling. This is shown to be very effective, even against tallows and privets. It's just important that it you're removing the outer bark layer. So you don't want to carve too deep. See, it's just that second layer in. So you remove the outer bark. The reason you're doing this is you're exposing the circulatory system of the tree and you're, you're causing it to dry out. It can no longer get nutrients going up and down. So it disrupts it and the tree eventually dies. There is a master naturalist, Cliff Tylek, he has created some really good videos. He is like the privet girdler of Austin. He's been able to clear out multiple acres just girdling privets. Now, remember, this is not going to be a quick fix, right? But it can be a really good fix for an area where you can't go out and clear it. Maybe chemical spray is just not an option for you. Tree girdling can be very effective. Oh, there we go. Okay. Looks like it wasn't advancing. So the next part of management, usually try to say chemical and mechanical. If you can get it just with mechanical, we always encourage that. It's really important. If you are dealing with herbicides, wear proper protection. Not that we have to worry about it right now, but don't apply it during rainy days, not during flowering periods. And, um, to be protected, keep making sure that everything is secure around you. So cutting and treating is one of my favorite methods because it limits the amount of spray. You're not actually spraying any herbicide out. So it can, it, you know, can help reduce what's going on. So cut and treat is just that you cut it and then you treat it. The thing is that it's the timing that's really, really important. Now, some, <laughs> except for when it comes to McCartney Rose, which we'll talk in a minute. So most plants, the best way to do it is you need to be cutting and treating it with herbicide within five minutes. So usually we suggest you have a team of people cutting and then a team of people treating and you just use a paintbrush and you paint the stumps. You go and you just paint every stump. You're not spraying. You're concentrating the efforts on what you're trying to kill. So it wouldn't harm your grass and nearby things, even though you might be using more of a broadcast herbicide. Direct foliar spray can be very effective. It's just important to note it it will take multiple tries. So, you know, if you spray your privet and you're like, man, it just came right back. You're going to have to keep trying and maybe you might have to mix in some cutting and treatment treatment with it instead. So with direct foliar spray, timing is really important. Do not do this when the plant is flowering at all because the pesticide, the herbicides will impact our pollinators so you want to kind of do it midsummer to fall. I know like if you're doing foliar spray on tallows, they are a lot more receptive in October and you definitely want to be aware of rainy periods. We don't need washout happening. Basal spray is kind of the same concept, but instead of spraying the leaves, you were spraying the base of the tree. And this is good if you're dealing with, you know, younger trees. It's really before the bark becomes corky and rough. So if the tree is too old, basal spray will not be effective. And then stem injection, this hack and squirt, it's basically you take an ax, you make downward hacks, and you then inject in the herbicide. So this is kind of combining the two aspects of, you know, you're cutting and we're somewhat girdling in a way, but really we're injecting in herbicide that will help cycle through the tree. This is also important to not do during flowering periods because their studies have shown that there could be residual effects from the herbicides to the pollinators because the herbicide is being circulated throughout the tree to every aspect of it, including its flowers and its pollen. So again, you want to do fall to late winter when you're doing these sorts of treatments. And then as I 
foreshadowed and I'm sure a lot more of y'all are familiar about is the rehabilitation phase is the most important. If you just cut it down, if you just dig it up and you don't put anything in its place, they will regrow. A lot of them have seed banks that last for years, years. And like the China berry itself, one tree will produce 100,000 seeds in one season. So that's a lot of seeds. So it's just important to think about that. And then remember, y'all have great resources at your fingertips as well, the nine natives. So, you know, they talk about the nine native species that are great for if you're getting full sun or you need more shade. So like the Cherokee sedge, American beauty berries, inland sea oats, and the Indian blanket, those are all great options. And definitely through the Coastal Prairie Conservancy, they have that amazing resource, but you can always look at our website for native alternatives as well. So management, I kind of touched on little bits here and there as I was just showing you brief introductions to the pests and plants that you will encounter. So kind of the overall take home message with management when it's talking about flatworms, slugs, apple snails and jumping worms. A lot of it is going to be dispose of it in a sealed container. Apple snails, if you see those bright pink eggs, please smash smash, smash away, smash as many as you can. I don't suggest smashing flatworms or slugs because when it, it's gross and flatworms can regenerate from segments. So if you don't get the whole thing, it's just not as effective, but smashing pink bubble gum, apple snail eggs, very effective. And we just do these things because we need to manage the populations. And so um, flatworms and slugs, they are very susceptible to salt. Flatworms especially, uh, if you just have a spray bottle of 30% vinegar concentrate while you are out in your garden or your yard, you can spray them. That way you don't have to touch them. You're not messing with the pH too much. You're not throwing salt everywhere. They will dissolve with the vinegar and you can move on. And then slug bait is effective for slugs, but it's really important to use um, the organic slug bait because uh, the other kind is very, it is fatal to pets. So you don't want to have those things around. Beer does not lure out slugs as much as you like. I mean, if you want to try that option, I would say beer with yeast makes it a lot. I mean, they like the yeast. So make, you know, day old dough and leave it out and then but so when they're coming in they come in through your plants your mulch or your soil so it's really important look at things when you're bringing it in say you've never seen a hammerhead flatworm or a jumping worm but then it's oh I just brought this rose bush that I planted it could have been related to that so just thinking about what am I bringing in checking the soil apple snails please just don't keep them as pets they are aquatic so they might appear in your area after a flooding event, but just definitely don't keep them as pets. Jumping worms, these are going to be really hard to remove from your area. They are soil dwelling organisms. You cannot spray them for anything because they're earthworms. If you kill them, you can kill your earthworms. So it takes a lot more of, you're going to have to thoroughly dig through your infected soil. Worm grunting is a very real thing as well. It's kind of where you, you stick a metal tube and you create vibrations and it causes worms to come up. So you could do the grunting and then you have to pull out all of your Asian jumping worms, right? It's going to take a lot of effort if you're infested, but it just because it takes a lot of effort does not mean you shouldn't do it. It's just when you think about if you're having jumping worm issues, heat treat your vermicompost that you're bringing in and you can sun or freeze treat any soil that you're bringing in as well. Kind of think of it as, you know, if you are clearing your soil, your backyard is under quarantine, you have got to quarantine things before they can come into your yard. And heat treatment and freezing just ensures that in your soil, there are no worm egg casings in there that could be erupting. And then also if you are an angler, just look at what kind of bait fish. Do not buy any Alabama jumpers. And if you are done fishing for the day, the way you throw away any bait, guys, sealed in a container and in a trash can. Because even if you just throw them on the water or on the ground, they can make it to the water's edge. So please, disposal in a sealed container. This is how you ensure they don't escape and spread. 
The container can be whatever you are comfortable with, a resealable mason jar where you just stick a bunch of slugs in, a Ziploc bag for each individual one, uh, alcohol bottles, water bottles, whatever works. As long as it is sealed, that's how you can ensure it's not getting out. Invasive tree and reed management. You can do a lot of options. And the main tech comb is, you know, check the soil for seed banks after you've removed them. China berry, tallow, and ligustrum, they do respond to hand pulling, weed wrenching, and girdling. Those mechanical options are possible. It's just if it's not showing the results you want, that's when you might want to combine with chemical treatment. And I have these things starred because it is important to note. Sometimes you have to be a TDA licensed applicator to buy the, the herbicides or pesticides that you were looking for. So just make note of that. Things like triclopyr glyphosate, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking more about the Grazon uh, PD and the 2,4-D, right? There, there are certain um, pesticides that you will need a professional. And you can always combine... You can do cut and treat and foliar spread. These are all very responsive to that. It's just with things like giant reed and golden bamboo, any segment can regenerate. So if you are just, and this is what's been a problem with our Texas waterways, is people are just cutting reeds upstream and then they float downstream and all it takes is one segment to start a whole new plant. So it's really important that if you are removing these things, right, you need to be removing them, not just chucking them on a trailer to then go to the dump and, and re-sprout there, right? You wanna make sure that you are bagging and disposing of them especially seeds. So I would not recommend chopping down your china berry or your tallow or your ligustrum when they have tens of thousands of seeds on them. I recommend cutting them more in the fall, but if you have to, at least bag up the seeds. Ideally, I would say burn everything, but that cannot be feasible at this time. And it's important. I, I know you know, we, we want to recycle and repurpose and reuse, but these are not the types of things that you repurpose into your compost or mulch or anything like that. Invasive pest management. I know there's a lot of words on here. So the, <laughs> the main take home is you're going to be dealing with fire ants. You could easily have red bay ambrosia beetle, Asian citrus psyllid or emerald ash borer popping up in your backyard. And some of these things, it's going to be really hard to treat. So it's a matter of time. So just, you know, if you have any avocado or red bay trees in your backyard, watch to see, are they wilting? Do they, you know, are there, their fruit not producing properly? Please contact us. Asian citrus psyllid causes a pathogen citrus greening. If your tree contract contracts citrus greening, there is no saving it. Just like if your tree contracts uh, laurel wilt, there is no saving it either. So it's really important. If you see a weird bug on your plants and you go to our website and you're like, holy cow, I need to email Ashley. Please do immediately. We will come out there. We will look. We will trap. Because if we can find the insect before it gives the tree the disease, we can save the tree. So uh, that's kind of what it's saying here in all of these words, right? So if you, your laurel tree, so if your red bay or your avocado is infested with the beetle, a professional can do tree injections to kill the beetle. However, if it is infested with laurel will, it's really important. I'm sorry, I keep, I'm trying to highlight and it won't because I'm clicking. It's just really important. You have to mulch these things. If the tree has contracted the disease or if your tree has emerald ash borer, you need to destroy the tree immediately. That means mulching it and then spraying it with a pesticide since we can't burn things right now. The reason I say also spray with the pesticide is we have to be triple sure that nothing is coming out of that wood pile. So same as for your citrus trees. So any citrus tree, lemon, lime, key lime, kumquat, grapefruit. If your tree starts with citrus, it is susceptible to this pest. So if you see and go to our website, if you see in Asia, something that doesn't quite look like an aphid, it looks just like, wait a minute, what's that? I don't like the way it looks. Please send us a picture because if it can, if it spreads citrus greening, you do have to destroy that tree. There are 
It can be saved if it's just the psyllid, but it will require a professional to help treat. If you're using some of these brands, there, is, there are home pesticides, home, but publicly available pesticides like seven and malathion that you can use if you see psyllids on your citrus tree. Emerald ash borer, mechanical, it's one of those, if it has it, it's doomed, you've got to chop it down. We want you to report this. I put that injections could be possible if you catch it really early on, but the thing is, this is a actively emerging and problematic invasive pest, and we don't want to give it time to find a new tree, because all it needs is a fresh ash, ash tree, and so we just need to be active when you're doing those things. The prevention is dispose of soil from new potted plants. If you are having constant red imported fire ant issues, they're not often found in the soil anymore, but that's how they were brought here. Watch for new mounds in your yard. And the take home message for these pests is really the don't don't move firewood. Definitely do not keep your tree if it has died from a disease or a beetle infestation. And don't bring sick trees to your property and don't keep it for compost and watch your trees accordingly. Invasive grass management. This is where it gets a little different. Like Johnson grass absolutely hates mowing or grazing. So if you have animals, grazing is a great way to trim it down. But bahia grass is not phased by overgrazing. So it kind of just depends on which one you're dealing with. Oftentimes some mowing with chemical treatment seems to be a good match in general, except for Johnson grass is showing herbicide resistance. And the main thing with Johnson grass is don't till it too early. It can excite it and make it regrow even better. So you wanna check for regrowth, hand pull any sprouts, and McCartney Rose is kind of the same. Repeated mowing can help with density, but it's kind of better if you do like a mow and a treatment, but this treatment is, is different than my cut and treat timeline. Mow and treat, they want you to not treat until a year after you mowed. And that's what the, re, you know, the researchers have figured out. Okay, you spray it too early, not as effective. So the cut and treat concept doesn't really go for this mow and treat from McCartney Rose. It does respond well to foliar spray. No soil applied herbicides doesn't work. So it's not beneficial. And deep rooted sedge, mowing it in two to week intervals can reduce seeds. And it's really effective if you combine it with a simple herbicide like glyphosate. Bahia grass, it's more about the, the full removal. Bahia grass has those rhizomes underneath. And so it's one of those, you pull it, but it still has the rhizomes, which can reproduce into like five more plants. And so you keep pulling. So removing the entire plant is really important, but also um, combining some herbicide in there as well can be effective. It does not like high nitrogen soils. So if that's something that you're able to do, you can kind of smother it with mulch or try to expose it to environments it doesn't like. But removal and um, cut and treat or foliar spray does seem to be very effective. But again, you want to do these more in your spring and your fall. And by spring, I mean before there's any seeds or flowers out, especially flowers on your McCartney rose. And then, you know, reseeding is important to the prevention. And then also to help prevent, spread, right, leave no trace, clean your own equipment after you've used it out in the field. Or maybe you took it to your friend's property or maybe your cousin borrowed it for a while, right? Just cleaning all of your equipment when it's being used, that's how you stop the spread as well. It just takes one seed to attach to something. So just being aware of that, using rubber boots when you're out, like things that are easy to wash off and like that, it can really help stop the spread. So how do you report them? and? other outreach initiatives that we have here. So a question I get a lot of times, especially now with the development of iNaturalist and things is why should I report to Texas Invasives? Like I report to iNaturalist, what, what's the difference? So the thing is that we have a direct connection 
with these entities that are actively looking for this species. The problem is that thousands of people turn in reports to iNaturalist on a daily basis. That's a lot of stuff to sift through and go through. And I can tell you, yes, there are a lot of invasive species biologists, but none of us are working in, in large departments. So there, you know, it's one of those, like, we don't have staffs of more than 10 to just have people dedicated to scrolling through things like iNaturalist, right? So if you report it to us, we can directly send it over to APHIS, Forest Service, Parks and Wildlife, even HGAC, whoever needs to know. That's why it's important to report it to us because we can streamline that information and have a chance on that early detection and rapid response. So you can always view our database and use the report it function. We have websites and we do have a phone app. The Android app is working on being updated, but they're found under two different names, Texas Invaders and Texas Invasives. So it's another way that you can report these species. And it was built by the Center for Invasive and Ecosystem Health through bugwood.org. Bugwood.org is a great resource in general. And they have other apps if you're interested as well. They have some that focus on just like a photographic guide, a forest pest, a way to squeal on pigs. I know that seems kind of silly to us down here in Texas. We're like, well, they're everywhere. But to states where feral hogs are not everywhere is why they have squeal on pigs. Or you can use the Ed Maps app. So Ed Maps is kind of like invasive species reporting. So our database feeds into EdMaps. So the more that you send to us, the more accurate this mapping system can be for the researchers that rely on it. So we're back on our homepage, Texas Invasives. You just click on the species that you want to report it. Or if you want a scrolling menu, you can always go to take action and report it and then select the species that you want. Thing is, no matter how you do it, whether if you're doing it through the QR code here, or if you prefer going to link tree slash Texas Invasives, that's the QR code link. If you're doing it, take action and report it. If you're doing it on a homepage, if you are reporting through the cell phone app, it does not matter. It does not require login. We want this data, however we can get it. But sometimes, like some species are not yet on the report it app. What, what are you supposed to do, right? Some of these were species that I talked to you about today that I'm like, these are growing concerns. What do you do? We need you to please, please email us at invasives at shsu.edu. It's especially important to include a photo and a location. I did put a little blurb up here. A lot of invasive plants are already well established. So you might, you know, ask, well, why, why don't you want, you know, tallow sightings or this? And it's not that we don't. It's just we do have a lot of data on some of these. And we're trying to track more that are emerging or not as well established as species like that. So something like the Japanese climbing fern is being tracked because it has not been here as long compared to the China berry. So any of these species, please email us at invasives at shsu.edu. And when you send a picture, a contrasting background is very helpful, especially if you're reporting on our website, I'm just trying to keep it as clear as possible. This is an example of a wonderful photo. This is an example of a not wonderful photo. So right here, I'm, I'm pretty certain it's a, the China berry that we're reporting, but obviously it's smothered in a vine, right? It's not a close up of what you're trying to report to us. So since you're sending it to us and we have to have a certain level of confidence when we confirm things, please just send a focused photo and we will do our best to identify it or find someone that can help us. Remember, you can always stay informed with our monthly iWire. If you sign up, that is the only thing you will get in your email box from us is an amazing digital newsletter talking about invasive species in Texas and across the country. And lastly, our citrus greening outreach initiative. So coming back to the public education aspect, I hinted on there are several counties in Texas that are under quarantine because of the psyllid right here. These are its larva with its waxy secretions. And this is citrus greening that it causes. So this little psyllid, it does not fly. 
it is directly related to humans moving citrus plants. So that's why there are quarantines. We've received funding from USDA APHIS to provide workshops on citrus diseases in general. So if that's something that's interesting to you, if you have a group of people that want to know more about what invasive citrus pests and diseases are there, please email me at my personal email, arm001 at shsu.edu to schedule. And then we can also provide complimentary in-field citrus sampling and psyllid trapping, where we will set traps and look for the pests, and then we can test your trees to see if it has citrus greening and move from there. So just to kind of recap, you can report emerging invasives and review management practices at texasinvasives.org. Email other sightings to invasives at shsu.edu and citrus sampling requests to ARM001 at shsu. And with that, I can take some questions. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you so much, Ashley. That was excellent. Lots of information. And I do love the newsletter. I've been getting the newsletter for years and it's um, always worth, well worth time to sit and read that and stay up to date on what's happening in our, in our state. Let me see. I can get to a few of the questions. All right. Um, Gail asked, what was the contact again for the tree girdling pro out of Austin? Ah, yes. Yeah, so, and Cliff Tylik, I think that's how you spell his name. I'd have yeah. to look up his email, but okay. yeah, let me, which I think I can. I log okay. out of my email for things like this. So then it's not like dinging while I'm talking, but that's his name. And yeah, he's amazing. He'll do workshops, help show you how to do it and everything. All righty. Yeah, so Gail, maybe that's when you should um, email Ashley to get his email address. All righty. Oh, sorry, my mouse. All right. Um, Bayou Land Conservancy said they're certainly having success with girdling. I'm guessing that's on Privet and Ligustrum up there along Spring Creek, Cypress Creek. Um, John asked which invasive plants should not be mowed, and you you did cover that a little bit. Did you want to say anything else about the ones we shouldn't be mowing? Um, yeah, that that was a few of the species that don't yeah. respond well to mowing. So really, like bahia grass doesn't respond well to it, but some of them do. But you can always go to our our website. So like Johnson grass again is is not one that you want yeah. to treat in that management. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Alrighty. Lan, who's on our team, asked, um, what do you suggest we do about the Aggie Horticulture's Earth Kind Plant Selector, which gives the highest rating of 10 for invasive plants such as Nandina, Miscanthus, Senesis, et cetera, almost all invasives um, in our region? I ask this question at every invasive talk. So is it that they are saying to uh to use those yeah because mm -hmm. yes yeah. so the thing is um and I, I left that slide off the thing is the invasive plants are are, are great plants for mm -hmm. easy upkeep and if they're not prohibited it, it's hard but I need to find out who runs the earth kind, just like I need to, yeah, there's a few things I need to get in touch with AgriLife because like, I think they still recommend like keeping hammerhead flatworms in your yard and, and things like that, where it's like, mm. that's not really the mm. mental, like that's not where we're at anymore right. with these yeah. organisms. So let me write that down. Earth okay. kind, that's a great, that's a matter of us finding the right people and then hopefully yeah. making a small dent, <laughs> like just getting right. them to remove one or two and put something else on. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Patrick asked if composting seeds will kill them. I I could not tell you that. I, I don't think. 
I, I know and I know that risky. yeah I from what I've gathered because I from people that have tried using like you know they'll throw the seeds or whatever then they start getting little sprouts popping up in their yeah. compost and stuff like that so I don't think it would inhibit seed growth because compost is so nutrient rich right I think it would just make it better make the plant yeah. grow better yeah yeah, at our preserves, we do not put any invasive plant material in our compost. It, yeah, it doesn't get hot risky. enough to, yeah. So definitely too risky. Um, Leanne Karsten asked if you could send a copy of the presentation or, or would you recommend we just go to the website for information you shared? Oh yeah, they can always go to our, our website. Like all that information is, is on the page. You just go to our invasives database. And yeah. it will list management. So then you can always have that point of reference. Mm -hmm. All righty. Doreen asked, if Texas AgriLife is a partner, can you influence their recommendations for invasive species listed in their Texas superstar list? So similar to Land's comment on yeah. those superstars are uh, a little too super yes. for our <laughs> ecosystems. <laughs> Right. Uh, Becky said, thank you. Great program. Okay. There's, there's Cliff's email address. And Tracy said, what do you recommend for my evil neighbors? Abhorrent practice of planting running black bamboo on their property, which abuts the Brazos river. That, oh, that Tracy, I wish I had better answers for you. <laughs> the problem is it's not illegal what they're doing. Yep. So you, you can't there. And, and that's something that I always have to remind, like people will be like, well, can you, I am not a legal entity. I can't do anything. I can just inform people and, and encourage others to hold people accountable. But yeah, that's the problem here is like, you can't, you know, go to your sheriff and say, Hey, this is illegal. Or, you know, try to get parks and wildlife or some yeah. authoritarian entity. Yeah. So, and unfortunately there, there's not a lot that you can do yeah, for that except for maybe educating. trying to talk to them but the fact right. that you say evil I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure you tried talking and then they planted more uh yeah. we've we've had that issue in some of the neighborhoods in Huntsville and I even mm -hmm. tried talking with the city council about please can you just make it to where Home Depot isn't selling this you know Huntsville's a small town plants only come in like four ways could we just have the and mm -hmm. and they just were like I don't but everybody mm -hmm. loves it. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely education. Um, Lynn said, thanks for a great presentation. Lots of ways to learn. Um, Tracy Kolb, I believe, That's said the, the Aggie Earth Kind plants is about 75% invasive. It has been a huge beef of mine in the Master Gardeners. They need to stop. <laughs> We agree. Well, hopefully you can make some inroads there. Yeah. And master gardeners, master gardeners could make some inroads there. I know. I, I need to like find out who's in charge. And then when I make yeah. my, because I, I do a lot of presentations with master gardeners and naturalists because they're great groups and I need to start yeah. being like, contact this person. Right. <laughs> exactly. Send an email. We'll yeah. Just start flooding them with why. Yeah. But, um, yep. Yeah, I know I would get more response from a brick wall, but I, I know I've, I've made ins, so I know some people and I, so that's why I'm like, hopefully I can come from the, Hey, when's the last time you've updated this list? Yeah. Um, and correct Lynn plants should not be mowed when, when flowering. Yeah. It's just one of those. It could be just helping it spread around that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Tracy said you'd get more response from a brick wall. <laughs> That is too bad. Oh, yes, definitely upstream yeah. waterway invasives. Yeah. It's a common way of things spreading. Let's see, that might be it. Yep, I think that's our last comment. All right, final call. Anybody have a question? <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Ashley. We really appreciate your time today. And thanks to everyone who could be with us for this um, online lunch and learn. And uh, hope you can join us in October.
for our next workshop and yeah, go sign up for the Texas Invasive Species Institute newsletter so you can stay up to date um, and help with reporting for these species that are um, still making their way into Texas. All righty. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you all so much. Have a good day. All right.